My name's Matthew Cook, and this is American Origin Stories. When you think of famous people in history, Victor Ochoa is not a household name. He doesn't normally come up in conversation. Perhaps because his story is so hard to believe or even comprehend. He was born during the Civil War and lived through World War II. I mean, we think the world is changing quickly in our lifetimes. Our experience pales next to Victor Ochoa. His grandfather was from Texas back when it was Mexican territory and conservative Mexicans were up in arms about Anglo illegals. When Victor was a kid, slavery was still legal in parts of the United States. And when Victor was an adult, an African-American whose parents had escaped a slave labor camp in Virginia had become a famous inventor in New York City. Victor was raised in the Wild West before electricity. And he witnessed a technological revolution. He watched the horse and buggy get replaced by cars and trolleys. He watched candlelight get replaced by electric power. He witnessed the invention of the airplane. But he didn't just watch all this happen. Victor Ochoa was an active participant. He once stole a gun from a sheriff's belt to shoot his enemies down on the street. He invented an electromagnetic brake, the adjustable wrench, a wind-powered electric turbine, and a functional airplane with flapping wings. Oh, and the pocket protector. The president of Mexico wanted his head on a spike, and the president of the United States called him a friend. He faked his own death, and he tried to start a revolution. This is the real most interesting man in the world. His name was Victor, Victor Leighton Ochoa. I can't find a definitive year of birth, but the location was Ojinaga, Mexico, right on the Rio Grande River, right at the Texas border, and most likely right smack in the middle of the American Civil War. He became a U.S. citizen in 1889, right after the invention of the light bulb, while he was a teenager or in his early 20s. He lived through the Mexican Revolution, the Civil War, and World War I and II, and he died in the 1940s as the Second World War was drawing to a close. He'd been a significant inventor, a writer, a journalist, an aviator, a miner, a business owner, a revolutionary, and a prisoner at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. Part of what made Victor Ochoa's life so amazing was the time and place in which he lived. And from that, there is so much to be learned. Mexico had just won its independence from Spain a few decades before Victor was born. Then they'd gone to war with the United States, the native nations, and Texas, which was at war with everybody. This is the time and place which laid the groundwork for a life as amazing as Victor Ochoa's. Texas had been home to over 30 native nations before the territory was claimed as a Spanish colony, and then by France, and then Spain again, and then the former Spanish colonists declared independence. And then Anglo settlers broke Texas itself off into an independent republic before controversially becoming part of the United States in 1845. And then 16 years later, it seceded. The Americas were in a constant state of massive revolution. Being that the first settler language on the continent was Spanish, many U.S. territories are Spanish words. Historians disagree over whether the word Texas is a Spanish version of friend or ally in the native language of Caddo, or if it was the Spanish word for the bald cypress tree native to the area. That's probably more likely, but don't tell Texans that. Historians also disagree on Victor Ochoa. David Romo, in his history of El Paso, called Victor an arms smuggler, a narco traficante, a currency counterfeiter, and a secret service informant. Your perspective on Victor Ochoa most likely depends on who you think had the most legitimate claims to the lands of river canyons and desert and mountains that were in dispute during the Mexican-American War, which preceded the U.S. Civil War by a hair over a decade, and over the same issues, land, tribal supremacy, and slavery. And this is the context in which we have to parse 
the local opinions about Victor's notorious grandfather, Ben Layton, a so-called scalp hunter of Scottish heritage. One traveler described Ben Layton as, quote, a remarkable man who'd been all his life in the mountains and knew nothing of government or law, who was a law to himself, end quote. In a letter of complaint to the U.S. Army about Ben Layton's trade with Native Americans, the governor of Chihuahua, Mexico, called him a man, quote, who does as he pleases, without respecting either the authorities of the Presidio or the laws of the country, end quote. The controversy centered around Ben Layton's land claims. Ben and his common law wife, Juana Pedraza, had taken up residency in the ruins of an old Spanish fort on the north side of the Rio Grande, about four miles downstream from Presidio del Norte, which would later come to be known as Ojinaga, Chihuahua, and soon be home to their three children and the birthplace of Ben's grandson, none other than the hero of our story, Victor Ochoa. So Ben Layton, he remodeled these ruins into a 40-room adobe trading post, and he bribed the mayor of Presidio del Norte and another former mayor to forge land deeds to this huge parcel of land. It's five miles long and over a mile wide. And that sounds all well and fine, perhaps, until we come to find out that that land had people living on it already. Well, Ben didn't let that stop him. Legend has it, as he ran off the local peasant farmers at gunpoint, mounted a cannon over his gate, and renamed the place Fort Layton, which soon became a landmark layover point in the region. Ben's detractors say he made his living exploiting travelers of every nation in stripes, so, no, he sounds like a terrible criminal. But in context, perhaps he was the least of them. Ben's backstory and the backstory of this land is something that every North American from Mexico to Canada should be familiar with. When Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821, Mexico's constitution legally joined Texas with Coahuila to form the state of Coahuila y Texas. And the newly independent Mexican government counted, get this, approximately 3,000 Americans from the United States living illegally in Mexican Texas. And this was a major problem because there weren't enough Mexican troops to patrol the borders or keep out additional squatters, nor did they have enough Mexican troops to push out these Anglo immigrants. Mexican immigration reformers argued for legalizing the Anglo settlers, help them turn their loyalty towards Mexico. And they wanted that for a lot of reasons. Mexico didn't have the manpower or the funds to protect their settlers from near constant Comanche raids and had hoped getting more settlers into the area could help them defend their new homeland, which of course would have sounded preposterous to the Comanches. But to Mexico, this was common sense. So they enacted the General Colonization Law, which enabled all heads of household, regardless of race or immigration status, to claim land in Mexico. Well, except for the Comanches. Now, Mexican conservatives were very worried about this. They were worried about assimilating Anglos into Mexican culture. And as a defense, they outlawed any religious practice outside Catholicism. Well, nine years later, they would change their minds completely because the United States wasn't sending their best. The second Mexican president, Vincente Guerrero, had outlawed slavery as one of his first acts in office. Guerrero had African heritage, and he was a recent descendant of slaves himself. He was the first president of African descent in all of North America, and he was a champion of racial and economic rights. Abolition had already been well underway in Mexico as part of their independence movement. And there was also a cynical sense among certain factions that prohibiting slavery would disenfranchise this influx of Anglo slavers and throttle not only their expansion in the territory, but this horrific economic engine of their growing power. Social historian Dennis Valdez documents in The Decline of Slavery in Mexico that another reason Mexico was able to outlaw slavery a third of a century before the United States was the simple fact that with increasing native and mestizo populations, wage labor was in greater abundance than slave labor. And so that gave wage labor more presence and more political power than slavers. So Mexico was now a free country, adjacent to a slaver nation. 
and the Rio Grande River became a river of deliverance for thousands of enslaved people trying to escape the colonies into Mexico, the land of the free. But nonetheless, Anglo settlers kept bringing slaves in, finding legal loopholes, like changing the status of the people they held in bondage from slaves to, quote, indentured servants for life. Anglo slaver power in Texas was becoming a major problem. And the early Mexican government was already in a state of turmoil. President Guerrero's vice president, Anastasio Bustamante, staged a coup and he ousted Guerrero. And then he expelled the U.S. diplomat, Joel Poinsett, a slaver from South Carolina, and outlawed any further immigration of United States citizens into Texas in 1830. The Mexican Secretary of State, Lucas Alamon, explained, saying, quote, Texas will be lost for this republic, talking about the Mexican Republic, if adequate measures to save it are not taken. Where others send invading armies, the Americans send their colonists. Well, his fears were correct. Within 15 years, Spanish and then Mexican Texas had been re-annexed to the United States, starting a war between these two empires. The U.S. president at that time was James Polk, and he embraced this trending 1840s catchphrase, manifest destiny. This idea that the United States was destined by God to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. And that was the justification for seizing one third of Mexico's territory, including Utah, named after the Uch tribe, and including California, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico, all Spanish words for formerly Spanish colonies, and now part of independent Mexico, and now added to the list of newly United States. Well, the newly United States didn't stay united for long. Texas promptly seceded, joining the Confederate cause when their slavers' cotton industry operations were threatened once again. And so 70,000 Texans enlisted in the horrific mission to create an independent slave country and failed. On June 19, 1865, federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas to take control of the whole state and enforce the Emancipation Proclamation that President Lincoln had issued two and a half years earlier. That's when U.S. General Gordon Granger famously read General Orders Number 3, quote, The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free. And this was our nation's second Independence Day. Juneteenth would become a national holiday, celebrating the end of Anglo-American slavery. And Fort Layton is currently offering picnicking areas and guided tours. Because with US troops, Union troops occupying Texas, the Mexican government didn't have the authority anymore to challenge Ben Layton's land claims. So Ben and his common law wife, Juana Pedraza, had a daughter named Isabella who married a customs collector named Juan Ochoa, who smuggled arms on the side to help Mexico fight off Spain, Britain, and then a French takeover of Mexico. The Ochoas had a ranch in Chihuahua, which was seized by oligarchs fighting over all this land amidst all this political unrest when Victor Ochoa was just becoming a young man. And this is when Victor's name first appears in records and history books. He doesn't like corruption, he doesn't like exploitation, and he doesn't like instability. In 1891, he brings together 300 Texas Mexicans in El Paso. And he must have given a rousing speech. He talked about self-protection. He talked about hiring local workers rather than getting cheaper labor from Mexico. He talked about fair wages. And he wants Texas Mexicans to preserve their culture and their morality and their sense of camaraderie. And he announces his bitter opposition to the current president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz, who he calls a dictator and a monarch. And he riles up hundreds of ranchers and attacks the Mexican federal army in two towns, Palomas and Ascension. Without training or strategy, he's soundly defeated. And according to The River Has Never Divided Us by Jefferson Morgenthaler, he puts on the uniform of one of the dead Mexican federal soldiers and escapes. And this is corroborated by a newspaper clipping at the Smithsonian Institution, which details that Mexican federal troops, quote, started a chase which led through the mountains, through treacherous ravines and gullies, 
a long traverse over 300 miles. But Ochoa finally manages to obtain some aid and eludes his pursuers and goes to Texas, where he remains in exile. So President Diaz, he puts out a $50,000 bounty for Victor's delivery back to Mexico, dead or alive. And he demands the U.S. government turn him over. Now, U.S. and Mexican government relations were respected at this time. Trade with Mexico had supported the Texas economy as its slave trade had crumbled. And so Texas authorities, they did capture Victor multiple times, but he seemed to always manage to escape. We should put escape in quotes because an arrest warrant was once issued for a Pecos County sheriff after Victor seemingly and inexplicably walked out of a county jail. Now, whether this was by his charms or his rhetoric or his brilliant mechanical skills, which have yet to be brought to their full use, we may never know. But on April 11th, 1895, Victor Ochoa was arrested in Texas by the U.S. Marshals for violating neutrality laws assembling an army and invading Mexico, for which he was sentenced to prison for two years and six months and fined $1,000. And that's when he was taken to Kings County Penitentiary in Brooklyn. Victor Ochoa was now famous, in some circles, infamous. Newspaper articles were written about him, which is one of the reasons we have so many details about his extraordinary life. And Victor Ochoa knew how to make use of the press himself, because that's when he issued the sad news that he had died in an asylum in Newark. But it was a total ruse. In his mind, he had to do it. President Diaz was going to kill him otherwise, with the U.S. government refusing to extradite him. Well, on February 15th, 1906, President Roosevelt, who he now considered a friend, granted his application for a pardon and a restoration of his civil rights. And so Victor Ochoa walks out of prison. And what does he do? He reinvents himself completely from revolutionary to inventor. And this makes total sense based on who Victor is and what his talents are and what's happening in this time and place, which is another kind of revolution, the second industrial revolution, the age of science and mass production. Now, a hundred years ago, from the perspective of 1906, when Victor walks out of prison, a hundred years ago in 1800, only 6% of the U.S. population lived in cities. 6%. By 1900, 40% of the U.S. population lives in cities. The first installation of public electric lights have gone up in New York, in Philadelphia, in Montreal, in London over the last 20 years, supervised by another amazing inventor named Louis Latimer. Now, the country's first electrical power plant has just been built at the Pearl Street Station in Lower Manhattan. Horses and oxen and donkeys, which had been the primary means of transportation all over the world, were suddenly being replaced by the car. The Wright brothers had just flown the first powered airplane in North Carolina three years previous, making a 12-second flight with Orville Wright in the cockpit. The world is transforming before Victor Ochoa's eyes, and he loves this stuff, and he understands it on a fundamental level. Electricity, mechanics, physics. And this is a time where patents are springing up all over the place. They're a great way to make money, and they're also being challenged and shared. It's only Henry Ford's challenging of the patent on the gas engine, which allows the auto industry to start sharing technology and thriving. And when we trace the origins of modern technology, and all the categories of technologies in which Victor Ochoa ends up making real contributions, from cars to planes, air conditioning, energy, household tools, we're not looking at a single moment or person. When we think of famous inventors, Thomas Edison, for example, he's most famous for inventing the light bulb, although he invented a lot of other things, incredible things like recording audio. Thank you, Mr. Edison. But Edison didn't invent the light bulb. He improved the light bulb. And he didn't invent electricity. Electric light had already been around for nearly a century, but it was delicate, unreliable. Carbon light had to be lit by hand. The bulbs flickered, they made a hissing noise, they burnt out. There were all kinds of other designs, but they were all too expensive and impractical. Edison worked on improving the technology, and he did. In 1879, he does a famous demonstration of a light bulb that lasted 13 or 14 hours. And that was Edison's improvement a one-day light bulb. 
Then there was Lewis Latimer, an inventor who's not as well known, a New Yorker, an African American. He refined Edison's improvement, making light bulb filaments even more durable. He wrote the first book on electric lighting, and soon it was possible for the entire planet Earth to light their homes with electricity. And then Latimer supervised putting up electric lights, public lights all over Manhattan, in great part thanks to this same abolitionist movement. Latimer's parents had escaped a slave plantation in Virginia. They made it to Massachusetts. They got recognized by a business associate of their former captors. They were arrested, and then they went to trial, a famous trial, where they were represented by two famous Americans, the first being none other than the great Frederick Douglass, the civil rights leader and abolitionist, and the second was William Lloyd Garrison, the British-American publisher of The Liberator, the abolitionist paper that documented in real time the story of anti-slaver and union hero John Brown and the civil rights leader Sojourner Truth. So we could say Lewis Latimer's parents had pretty solid representation and they were able to buy their freedom. And their son, Lewis Latimer, he enlisted in the Civil War. He joined the US Navy. And after an honorable discharge, he worked at a patent office where his conceptual design skills were discovered and the rest is technological history. Lewis also worked on the advancement to the telephone, created a forerunner of the air conditioner, all kinds of things to which Victor Ochoa would also contribute and are usually all solely credited to Edison. And it's important to understand why that is. Because Edison oversaw the creation of the entire electric market. And because his products ran on DC current, called direct current, where the electric charge only flows in one direction, and other companies like those being started by George Westinghouse and Tesla, the real Tesla, used AC current, which is alternating current, where the charge changes direction. Well, Edison was actually on the wrong side of this argument because alternating current was cheaper to generate. But that wasn't going to discourage Edison. He used the press to wage a market war because the electricity market was going to need to be standardized in order to establish a grid and coordinate with the local government so everyone could get plugged into it. And the public need for standardization and technology is another topic that would be really good for everyone living in the modern era to understand but we're gonna devote a separate episode to that. So back to Edison, he wants the electricity market and he goes hard. He attributes electricity related deaths to alternating current, his competitor's system, doing ads, making it sound dangerous. And then his lowest point, Thomas Edison begins promoting electrocution as the most effective means of capital punishment. And he actually wrote a letter to the death penalty commission in favor of using alternating current, his competitor's system. And his company tried to use the phrase to Westinghouse someone, meaning to electrocute someone. But as Edison ends up losing the battle because Westinghouse AC, of course, becomes the standard to which we use, and New York City installed a Westinghouse electric grid. That's the grid that Victor Ochoa sees in 1909 when he walks out of prison and electric trolleys are being installed in all five boroughs. Well, Victor Ochoa was ready because he invents the electric brake. Well, he invents an improvement on the electric brake. He uses electromagnetics, and he builds on the work of another self-taught Civil War era inventor, Granville Taylor Woods, an African-American who most likely invented a version of the telegraph before Edison did. It takes a village and a lot of passion. Having versed himself in every new emerging technology, Ochoa designs something that can be easily mass-produced, a fountain pen and a pocket protector. And then he applies the income and his understanding to the construction of a flying machine, which he called a collapsible monoplane, and founds a new company and becomes the president of the International Airship Company of Patterson, New Jersey. And the company builds the now infamous Ochoa plane. A newspaper article at the time describes it as, quote, about 26 feet wide. The machine measures from front to back only six feet. The rear rudder is similar to a bird's tail. The whole machine weighs about 250 pounds. The inventor's been working on this aeroplane more than 20 years. And during that time has succeeded in putting together several machines that operated successfully for short distances. And with this, he believed he had solved the problem of aerial flight. His earliest models, propelled by clockwork, flew with remarkable stability, end quote. 
And with this press, Victor Ochoa becomes part of the movement to promote aviation as a practical new form of transportation, accurately predicting, quote, the airship of the future bound on a long journey will rise to the proper height and will fly around the earth or half or quarter of the way around it, regardless of conditions in the atmosphere below, end quote. Now Ochoa is on a roll. In 1919, he creates an improvement on the electric wind turbine. Instead of circular, he makes them with swinging shutters to limit wind resistance. It's equipped with storage batteries, so enough electricity can be stored to light a house or run mechanical motors. This is 1919. He files patents for his inventions in Czechoslovakia, France, Germany, Great Britain, Japan, Mexico, Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. And now he begins diversifying his investments. It looked like Victor Ochoa was well on his way to becoming a titan of industry in his pursuit of the American dream. A phrase that had just entered the public lexicon, coined by the Venezuelan historian James Truslow Adams. Adams had thought America had lost its way, putting material values over spiritual ones. For Adams, actually, the American dream was not, in his words, quote, a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of a social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognized by others for what they are, regardless of the fortuitous circumstances of birth or position, end quote. Perhaps Victor Ochoa hoped to prove that America could provide both because his next endeavor was to literally open a gold mine in Sinaloa, Mexico. And he partnered with two men to help him expand that business, who turned out to be very poor choices for business partners. Ochoa got sick, and while he was recovering, the men stole his money, his gold, his horses, and left him to die. Somehow, he managed to nurse himself to health and make his way back to El Paso, and somewhere around 1936, he was walking down the street with his friend, the chief of police, when he saw the men. They drew first, but it was Victor Ochoa, unarmed, who was able to grab the chief's gun and shoot first. He shot them both. The chief took him to the local judge who agreed it was self-defense, but these two men were from influential families, so the judge advised him that he needed to go back to Mexico. And so Victor Ochoa returned to Sinaloa, Mexico after the 1936 shooting. He married Amanda Cole, the granddaughter of Thomas Cole, the American painter whose most famous painting is The Last of the Mohicans, based on the book covering the wars over these lands we call the Americas. And it's believed Victor Ochoa passed away in Mexico in 1945. The investigative press outlet, Everybody's Magazine, which was famous for Upton Sinclair's condemnation of the meatpacking industry, once published an article describing Victor Ochoa as a human Gatling gun, a bloodthirsty revolutionist. And there's actually no documented evidence that the Ochoa plan ever really took off. Well, Ochoa sued the paper for slander. He said the article had injured him and that he was the opposite as described. Whether Victor Ochoa was a genius, a criminal, a patriot, a traitor, or a hero whose legacy was purposely buried in the history books, or perhaps a combination of all the above, is a matter of perspective. Either way, Victor Ochoa is a contender for the real most interesting man in the world. See you next week. Stay thirsty, my friends. <laughs>